Hey everyone, if you're like me, you love plants. All plants. They are so beautiful, even in the house. So today, I thought I would talk about some of my favorite house plants and a few tips that will help you be successful in keeping them both indoors and, yes, outdoors. Stay tuned. The Garden Home Vlog is made possible by the following sponsors. Gilbert H. Wild & Son, Sun Patience, Arkansas Parks and Tourism, Ralston Family Farms, First Community Bank, and Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. For more information, log on to pallensmith.com. Now back to P. Allen Smith and the Garden Home Vlog. As with all of my shows, I want to give you some basic, fundamental tips on how to be successful with houseplants. Now, I think the first thing I want to say is let's blow up this idea that houseplants have to be in the house. If you're interested in a tropical sort of look, then you may want to consider houseplants for the outdoors. I know it's a radical thought, but just think about it. Some of my favorite houseplants can be used in the garden. And why not? They all came from the garden somewhere, right? I mean, these beautiful houseplants you see here in my set, some of them that I grow in my home, they come from different parts of the world. And the reason they're houseplants, for the most part, is they can't take cold weather conditions, right? So the summer is a great time to have some of these houseplants outdoors on your porch or patio, or even use them in your flower beds. It depends on the look you want to go for. For instance, take a look at this beautiful thing. This is an Aglionema. Weird name, sounds like a skin disorder, I know. But look at the gorgeous range of pinks among this green. And this plant can be planted in the garden in shade and will flourish throughout the warm months. You can plant it in its container, just like this in the ground, and pull it up and bring it into the house. And what I love about it is it plays so well with things like impatience, ferns of any kind, and this splash of color, well, it creates visual interest in the garden. Now, whenever you take your house plants outside, and what I like to do is, hey, let's send them off to summer camp. They deserve a chance to get outside, right? I mean, that's where they came from in the beginning. So in the summer, you can place them in containers or you can put them in the garden, as I've already suggested. But when you bring them back in at the end of the season, you want to wash them off gently. Check them for little hitchhikers, often on the undersides of the leaves, and then bring them in. What I like to do is when we first start getting some of those cool nights, uh, I begin to pull them a little closer under cover and then eventually bring them in just before it really drops. So you can imagine this plant in a flower bed. Maybe you put two or three together. And as I mentioned, they're great with impatience or ferns or whatever. Uh, this is one that you probably know very well. This is an alocasia or a type of elephant ear. Um, they make a beautiful house plant. This plant will also grow in wet, soggy soils. Um, it'll take a little more sun. And what I like about it is the scale of the leaf. It creates wonderful texture in the garden. Give it sun, give it shade. It's going to grow to a large size. So you might bump it up into a larger pot, place it in the garden, but be mindful of what you're going to do with it in the winter. I've told you this on other shows, that what I like to do with some of these tropicals is bring them in and some of them can die down to the bulb. And that's the case with these elephant ears. I just bring them in, cut them back, and I do not water them. I don't even take the time to dig them. I just don't water the soil in the container, and the bulb will sit there in a state of dormancy until it's ready to bring them back out. You can store them in your garage, or if you have some sort of hoop house. Anything that will keep them above, say, 40 degrees, they're going to be just fine. Now, take a look at this plant. Um, I used to call this the Hawaiian Thai plant. I remember when it became very popular and lots of people had it. My grandmother had to have one of these. And it's actually a cordyline. But look at the red leaf color to it and this beautiful bright pink edge. You can just imagine that again in the garden or a centerpiece in a container 
or out on your patio. Um, these things will last for a long time if you follow the practice that I just mentioned by bringing them into a place that isn't necessarily fully heated, but remember, they're not going to look their best. Ideally, you would want to bring them into your home in a room that gets full sun, particularly like east sun is very nice. That morning sun, about a half a day sun is all they need, and they'll continue to thrive. You do want to back off the fertilizer during the months when they're dormant. They're asleep. They don't need to be fed when they're going to sleep. The day length is shorter, so they are not in a growing cycle. If they're not in a growing cycle, they really don't need to be fed. Now, that's different once it breaks spring and we have longer days, particularly if you bring them outside, they're getting more light, that's when you want to feed these plants. And when it comes to cleaning them up, the old rule that we use in the field or out in the garden is the three D's for pruning. If it's dead, diseased, or damaged, cut it out and move on. So cordylines are very popular for the center of containers. They were popular in Victorian times. We see those, people call them spikes. These are tropicals. Tropicals became very, very popular uh, in the mid 19th century, all the way up, well, till today. Now here's an old fashioned house plant that many of you know. This is the old snake plant. Well, I guess it's called that because these are long vertical elements, snake-like, or it's also called mother-in-law's tongue, a very sharp, point here you can see. Um, but its botanical name is Sansevieria. Now some of these are variegated. They come in lots of different forms. They're dwarf types. But these can be very stylish in a container and they will grow in really low light areas. So if you've got, for instance, a covered porch, these are great in that dark corner if you like this shape and form. Uh, they'll also work in one of the shadier places inside your home. This is a fiddle leaf fig. It actually is in the fig family, ficus family that is. And um, this is a, a beautiful plant. One of my favorites, I love these giant leaves on them and they can really give a tropical touch. They're just absolutely fantastic. And then here we just have a, a basically a yucca a member of the yucca family. Now you've seen these growing in gardens. You may have even seen them growing on the sides of the road. Uh, there are all kinds of yuccas out there. This is one of the tropical types that are often grown as a standard with a trunk, as you can see here. Now, the thing with yuccas, as you can imagine, when you've seen these growing, they're usually growing in places where it's very dry or the soil is very poor. That's a little telltale sign for us that we don't need to water this one very much, all right? So sort of understand where these plants come from and you will know how to care for them. If they come from arid and dry regions of the world, then you wanna back off the watering. But some of these lusher tropicals need consistent moisture. That's just stick your finger down in the side of the container. If it's consistently moist, you're doing your job. But with the yuccas, I tend to like to let those become dry, like many of the uh, hens and chicks and succulents and cacti and things like this. Now, this little guy right here is uh, one I want to point out. This is a croton, and crotons can come in lots of different colors. There's actually solid green ones, but there are those that are have a lot of yellow variegation in them. Uh, this one has clearly red um, and orange, and the more sunlight they get, the more likely they are to have this variegation in color. These are particularly good, I think, for fall containers. Uh, if you think about these oranges uh, that you're seeing here and yellows in containers, maybe with pumpkins around the base of it, it's a great house plant. I like to combine with mums or other fall colored plants that you might use to decorate your patio or terrace. But just remember the croton. I've done holiday centerpieces for Thanksgiving with this plant, and they're very, very beautiful. If you've ever visited some sort of um, conservatory, at a botanical garden, for instance, and you've seen all these tropicals and how they can be used one next to the other, it's really pretty exciting to see all this foliage. 
And that reminds me of one of the real practical reasons that we ought to have more house plants in our homes. And that's because these plants are air filtration systems. There was a study done by NASA many years ago that indicated that 10 to 12 house plants in a home will help purify the air. And I think that many of our homes are toxic because of all of these chemicals that are being released, all these, the off-gassing of carpets and um, as well as finishes that we have on wood and paint and so forth, we're breathing those chemicals. So doesn't it make sense to have plants, something beautiful, green, and alive in your home that makes you feel good when you look at them to actually help you keep your house healthy? And these plants can do that. You can see the palm behind me. Just think about what that can add to a, a corner of the room that maybe doesn't get a huge amount of light in your front room or TV room. And the whole time it's giving you all this beauty, it's also helping purify the air. This majesty palm is one that I recommend bringing outside if you can, perfect for a covered porch or something like that through the summer. Uh, it's very slow growing, um, so it's not going to have to be repotted that frequently. Um, you're going to uh, probably just keep the soil moist on it for it to do the best, and it doesn't require a whole lot of fertilization. The, the thing to also keep in mind is these palms really tend to like temperatures in that, say, 65 degree to uh, 95 degree. They can really take the hot, humid conditions. But I do recommend moving them outside during the summer. Again, give your house plants a break and let them go to summer camp, right? Okay. So with that, why don't we answer a few questions about some of these house plants? All right, so here we go. It says, I live in Northwest Louisiana and in a new home. The backyard was severely neglected. I've seen some of that. So we're going to make the backyard Southern tropical. Love it. Great idea. With plants that will survive in winters in zone eight. Any suggestions? So he wants that tropical look. He's down in, uh, well, Northern Louisiana. I think the alocasias and, and colocasias, these elephant ears would work very well. Uh, they're going to die back in the winter, John, uh, but you can pile mulch over them. The other is uh, some of the banana plants. We didn't bring any on the set, but I have a few at the farm. Moss Mountain Farm. Um, There's some red bananas. Uh, some of the, they don't have to be the really tall ones. I would recommend maybe some of the dwarf bananas. Some other things that you can add to your garden to give that tropical flair would be just a fig tree, an ordinary fig tree like Miss Big Fig at the farm. She's a Celeste fig, but those big leaves are going to look a lot like this fiddle leaf fig here, a ficus. So that will give you that bold texture. And you'll never have to worry about it getting too cold for a fig tree in your part of the world. Also, on this show, we've talked a little bit about Agapanthus, Lily of the Nile. I believe you could grow Lily of the Nile right out there in the full sun. They'll die back in the winter, but they'll come back for you. And who doesn't love those beautiful blue blooms? Our friends in California get to see them all the time. But for me, they're a special treat in the garden. And I have to bring them in and um, park them in a hoop house and just keep them above 40 degrees through the winter. That's how we grow agapanthus. And then we just fertilize them when they bring them out in the spring once it begins to warm and whammo, there they go. And then very soon they start producing those gorgeous blue flowers. Now John, another plant you might consider would be some of the palms. Now there are some native to Northern, well, throughout Louisiana, and that's the palmetta palm. And those would be a slam dunk for you. Uh, and I like to group them in big masses together and talk about easy to care for gardening. That could really work well for you. Maybe they become the evergreen backdrop of a waterfall in your back garden. That could be really, really beautiful. The other thing that has a, a very tropical sort of look to it uh, that you could grow over an arbor is uh, Clematis armandii. Um, it's a, it's an evergreen clematis, has a long strap-like leaf, and it blooms in the early spring with a white flower. So look for clematis armandii. It, it really is worth growing and has a beautiful tropical look to it. 
And then the other plant is Dutchman's Pipe. Um, it will grow in northern areas, but I think the leaves of Dutchman's Pipe look very, very tropical, as well as gourds. So we could go on and on and on. Gourds to me look extremely tropical, but of course you're going to have to grow those year after year, but they're a lot of fun to grow over a hoop and they give you that tropical look. And the last thing I'm going to suggest are cannas. Um, in our part of the world, um, we're in Arkansas, you're in Louisiana, the old fashioned canna and it's myriad of colors uh, and, and heights. Some of them grow quite tall and some of them are dwarf varieties. Those are excellent in containers. They'll grow in water, uh, standing water. And I just think they're, they're ideal for that tropical look. Hey, I hope these ideas have been helpful to you and thank you for your question. Okay, we have another question here from um, Savannah. Um, she says, hi, my husband and I've been uh, married for just over a year. We recently moved into our house and started our first garden together and we're loving it. We've discovered that we have different tastes and plants. He likes really exotic tropical looking plants, whereas I go for more native natural looking plants for our zone 7B, 8A zone. So it's not unlike the one that we just spoke to with John. And we live in the foothills of South Carolina. So that palmetto palm is going to be perfect for your garden, Savannah. Now, she's asking, how can she marry these two combinations for a cohesive garden? Savannah, I have to tell you that one of the most interesting gardens that I ever visited was one in England. And this woman who had created this garden was absolutely masterful, uh, an, an artist uh, par excellence. And she had done groups of perennials, traditional perennials that you might see in an English garden, along with tropicals. And it was absolutely stunning. So she just blew away all the rules and she said, I'm going to combine these things. And the trick that she used is she used the tall and coarse leaved plants towards the back of her flower borders. And as you move forward, the plants became, the, the leaves became a little more refined and the blooms became a little more delicate. And she mixed all kinds of things in there. Tropical hibiscus were growing next to Veronica and Veronicastrum. She had Verbena bonariensis growing next to those beautiful black elephant ears. And this juxtaposition of the tropical and the temperate, if you will, was really exciting. So this is a wonderful question. And what a great project for you and your husband to, to work on, because I do think you can come up with some killer combinations by dipping into the tropicals and that juxtaposition. Just get out of your mind that, you know, well, I've got to plant these here and, you know, they can only be associated with this kind of plant. Really don't go by the rules. Take the daylilies and plant the daylilies next to Sansevieria. Can you imagine uh, yellows, pale yellow daylilies next to the Sansevieria or a Croton? Hey, why not? So um, I love your spirit of experimentation and good luck with that new home and new garden. I hope you've enjoyed today's show on 101 Houseplants. We'd love to show you how we use houseplants on our porches and in our gardens at Moss Mountain Farm. So plan to come and visit us. And remember, you can follow us on all our social media platforms and also see some of these uh, shows on YouTube as well. All right, until next time, Alan Smith, happy gardening.